Good evening. It is a blessing to gather in the Lord's name, in the presence of His Spirit, in the evening of the Lord's day. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. My Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. As we gather, we begin our praise. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus, to take him at his word. Let us pray. Into your hands, O God, 
we commit ourselves. We do so because your spirit draws us. In the evening of this day we have come, whether within these walls in your sanctuary or in the quiet of our homes, we have come to you, to commune with you, to allow your spirit to speak to us, to touch us at the point of our need, but also to hold us, to shape us, to equip us, to fit us for every good purpose that you have in store for us. To that end, before anything else, we would acknowledge that you are. You are the author of life. You are the source of being. You are the altogether knowing and wise one. And though we are tempted at times, and because of our circumstances and those of the world in which we live, prompted to question and even to rant and to rage at all that we do not know and all that we know that is not right, we would ask for grace first to be still, to be quiet, to acknowledge that we did not and we cannot make ourselves. We did not will ourselves into existence. We know not the measure of our lives, the number of our days, We bow in the presence of the one who knows the end from the beginning and yet esteems us personally, individually, uniquely. As those upon whom you lavish your love. You sustain our lives. You renew our lives. You give us by your Spirit life, life that is filled with exquisite beauty, profound meaning, relationships that we cherish, even though they often bring us pain. You are our God. We are your creatures. You are the author and giver of life, and we are the recipients called to share that life. In partnership with you and in community with one another. And we thank you. We pray tonight that your spirit would open for us a deeper window on the meaning of our lives and your purpose for life through and with us. That we might yet live 
fully, abundantly, with abiding satisfaction and joy and peace. Because we live and move and have our being in you. In the name of Jesus, who reveals you to us, we come. We pray. We rest. We abide. Amen. This evening we're going to read two portions from Scripture initially. The first is from Psalm 46, a psalm that people have turned to in times of challenge, distress, a psalm that provides a significant measure of assurance. The Word of God. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way, though the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see the works of the Lord. The desolations he has wrought upon the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow, shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. He says, I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. And then in the New Testament, the Gospel according to John, second chapter, the very last three verses from verse 23 on. Now, while he, that is Jesus, was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, Many people saw the miraculous signs he was doing and believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all men. He did not need man's testimony about man, for he knew what was in a man. May God bless to our understanding his Holy Word, to his name and to our souls be the prophet from our reading and meditation. Before we come to that meditation in substance, we're going to sing again, this time, an evening prayer. Jesus, tender shepherd, hear me. Bless your little lambs tonight.
Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all men. He did not need man's testimony about man, for he knew what was in a man. Last night, as I was preparing for the Lord's Day and our services and reflecting upon where we were in the world, I stumbled across on my feed on the internet a post that a colleague had shared which reproduced a very short snippet from the pastor of Grace Reformed Church in Kiev, Ukraine. And this particular pastor, to give the background, had resolved, come what may in the midst of the current challenge for people living in that city, which is under significant bombardment to remain at his post in the care of the congregation trusted to his care and he shared one word which profoundly he had come to not only know but experience in the midst of present circumstances, that word was Emmanuel, God with us. In a very brief and simple manner, he drove home this truth in the midst of what to the world and to the people of his community was the opening up of hell. The presence of God was with him and those he cared for. And he said it was precious. Not something that one would take for granted or assume or not something that one would necessarily expect in the midst of the situation in which he and others find themselves. But a very profound, and yet profoundly simple affirmation, God is present. I thought about that as I came to reflect further on our text today for this evening's service. While Jesus was in Jerusalem, the Passover feast, he had opportunity to do other miraculous signs beyond the changing of the water into wine, the first of his miraculous signs. Many people saw these things and were led to follow Jesus. Text says in verse 23 that many believed in him or in his name. But unlike those who draw a crowd and gain a following, Jesus was not impressed, much less was he moved by 
those. So often today, particularly because we are connected by audio and video media, it is very easy for one person to say or do something that instantly gains a whole bunch of attention and followers, whether it's on Facebook or Twitter or other social media, people follow and identify as friends. And many find that if they get no response to what they share, they're plunged into despair. The more followers, the more attention, the more those who have a name put stock and substance and begin to cater to their following. Our text says that Jesus would not entrust himself to them. And that led me to put up for a title for our reflection tonight, the question, does Jesus trust me? And I invite each of us to ask ourselves that question. Does Jesus trust me? Does he trust you? And the shocking answer that I'm going to give is that in the first instance, the answer is no. Later on, we'll come to see that there is a sense in which that question can be answered affirmatively in a limited way. But the first and right answer, the most profound answer to that question, is in our text. Jesus would not trust himself to them. That's what the word en trust means, to place himself in their hands. Now, the image that comes to mind here is one that has stayed with me for a very long time. And it's the picture of a firefighter or a first responder laying hold of a child and carrying that child to safety. In the first instance, and not uncommonly, the rescuer would say to the individual, take hold, grab on, hold tight. And so the one being rescued puts their arms perhaps around neck, or grasps onto hand, whether the person is being rescued from above or below, hang on for dear life. But as hard and fast as the one being rescued is holding on, there comes a point at which the grip weakens and one lets go. But the rescue is successful, not because the one being rescued has laid hold of the rescuer, but because the rescuer has laid hold of the one being rescued and has that one secure in their grasp. And 
And that picture, that image, continues to be a profound, biblically-based, scripturally true statement about how Jesus saves, how he rescues, how he knows, and how he holds his own. And it is all predicated, first and foremost, on what lies behind our text. And that is that Jesus, as the divine Son of God, knows you and knows me far better than we know ourselves or can know ourselves. I want to point to a few underlying truths in Scripture that we need to be reminded of that are easily forgotten, particularly in this day and age when we are taught that we continually know ourselves better than anybody in previous generations has known self. Prophet Jeremiah is where I want to begin with what is perhaps most out of fashion, but nonetheless profoundly true. Jeremiah 17 and verse 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, verse 10, search the heart, and examine the mind. It is not popular to be told that the heart is deceitful above all things. But if we would rightly understand why Jesus would not entrust himself to anyone, it is here explained. He knew all men. He knew all people. And as we are told in many places in Scripture, God knows hearts. Acts 15 and verse 9, uh, the apostle is preaching and testifying. And among other things, this is what he says. God who knows the heart shows that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them. This was in the midst of the first church council where the apostles and elders were considering the question as to whether Gentile believers had to be circumcised in order to become Christ followers. Peter is the one who's speaking, and he makes the point that God knows the heart. And he makes his decision not on the outward actions, but on the inner knowledge, which, as Jeremiah says, can be and is deceitful to every human being. We do not know ourselves as well as we think we know ourselves. Again, Paul, when he comes to address the Romans in chapter 8, builds on this. He says at verse 27, the Spirit aids our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray, but the Spirit intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. He who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit. Not only does God know our hearts, but he searches them. And the first thing we need to know about ourselves 
is that if we would be in tune with the knowledge of God of us, for us, and with us, is that we need to cooperate by asking him to search our hearts. Psalm 139 is a psalm in which David, undoubtedly after he had come face to face with his own deceit, comes to say this, O Lord, you have searched me, and you know me. You know when I sit, when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. And after reciting at great length the significance of much of that knowledge, saying things like, you created my inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to me to be. He gets down to the end and he says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. And see if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. You see, Jesus does not depend upon our knowledge of ourselves before he initiates and acts on his knowledge of us. And so there are some of the disciples who believed on his name, but he knew that that believing on his name might very well be a feeble belief, and it might be a fickle belief. We know, for example, that even though Peter blurted out, even if everyone else deserts you, I will not. And yet after the rooster crowed the third time, Peter wept because he had denied three times knowing Jesus. Oh, he knew him, but his heart was deceitful above all things. And he didn't know himself as well even as he knew Jesus. And therefore, Jesus did not entrust himself to him. Now, I bring this forward because it is vital that anyone who is seeking assurance in matters of faith and life needs to understand that our assurance is rooted first and foremost not in our knowledge of ourselves, nor even in our knowledge of Jesus. But first, it is rooted in Jesus' knowledge of us. The second thing follows, and it is perhaps even more astonishing, in spite of and because of Jesus' knowledge of us, he also holds us. Most famously, in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6, Paul says, I am confident of this, he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion in the day of Christ Jesus. He is in it with us, for us, for the long haul. And John says the same thing as he reports Jesus' own testimony 
in John chapter 6 and verse 39. We read for our call to worship this, this, this evening uh, Jesus' words, I am the bread of life. Notice carefully what verses 38 and 39 say. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Before we jump to that last verse, we need to carefully look at the one before. This is the will of the one who sent me and whom I have come to do. Whose will I have come to do that I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. Jesus is saying in this declaration that the grip I have on those whom my Father has entrusted to me is absolute. Reformed faith emphasizes perseverance of the saints, that perseverance is rooted in the iron grip that the Savior has upon God's chosen, beloved people. And that is the ground for our assurance. It does not depend upon how strong your faith is, or how strong my faith is, or how strong our grip is on our understanding of Christ, or of God, or of ourselves. It depends on God's perfect knowledge of us, and Jesus holding us in his hand. And so at the beginning of his ministry, Jesus says, or John says of Jesus, he would not entrust himself to them. For he knew all men. He did not need man's testimony about man. Or to put it in the vernacular today, he did not need human testimony about humanity. He knew what was in human hearts. Now, I emphasize this because it is fashionable and it is not wrong that we emphasize in the church our human responsibility. And we'll come to that in just a moment before we close. But as I've said on previous occasions, J.I. Packer in his book Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God makes the point that there are two parallel truths that cannot be separated, that cannot have one trump the other. And those two truths are that God is sovereign. He is fully in charge. And man is responsible. Human responsibility and accountability before God is taught by God. We will all stand to answer for ourselves. But it is equally true that God is sovereign. Though we find it hard to reconcile those two things together, 
I want to suggest that our text this evening helps us understand this. Because even though Jesus explicitly says he would not entrust himself to those who believed upon him, he did not need their testimony about him or about themselves. Because he knew fully the human heart and each human heart and all human hearts. The course of his ministry subsequently and the course of the Spirit's ministry even to today is that we are called to give testimony. He is not beholden to our testimony, but he calls for it. Those who acknowledge me before others, I will acknowledge before my Father. Those who deny me before others, I will deny. Now, I point this out because the answer to the question, does Jesus trust me, in the first instance is no, because he knows me. But in the second instance, the answer is yes. He entrusts me and you and all believers with the presence of his Spirit. And by pouring his spirit into us, he gives us both the capacity and the responsibility to bear a faithful witness to the world of his knowledge, of his truth, of his love, of all that the spirit produces in us and through us as testimony to the world. None of us can plead the excuse that he is not with us. None of us can plead the excuse that we do not have the power or the knowledge because his spirit lives with us. We are called as disciples not only to believe in his name, but to bear testimony to that name. And of course, when Peter denied Jesus, he had to repent. When he repented, Jesus said to him, feed my lambs, feed my sheep. Do my will. Do the works that I entrust to you to do. Now I raise this as we close simply because this question, does Jesus trust me, is, I think, worthy of our reflection in this season of Lent. If we recognize that our salvation is wholly a gift of God and is not predicated first on our knowledge or our ability, human heart is deceitful and it is by the grace of God alone that our hearts are given, our minds are given true knowledge, it is by the grace of God alone that our wills are renewed by the Spirit of God that we can say yes to our Savior and submit to our Lord. That is a gift, and it precedes 
action on our part. But having had that gift, having received the gift of faith, having received the grace of God, we have been entrusted with a priceless treasure, a treasure for which we will be called to give account, and which we are, by our faith professed, responsible to share. And as the pastor of Grace Reformed Church in Kiev, precious truth in one word holds dear. God is with us. Emmanuel. And that God should come to be with us even and especially in the disinformation, the chaos, and yes, in the midst of hell on earth, in all its forms, is our peace. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks that Jesus reveals the depth of your knowledge of us. You know our thoughts before we know them fully. You know our words before we articulate them. We do not need to plead with you to know and understand our circumstances. Show us afresh just how profoundly deep and wide is your knowledge of us. And in so doing, take away from us every pretense that we are in charge and that we know better. Help us to lay those things down at your feet. And then, O oh God, grant us grace afresh to treasure the presence of Emmanuel, and that you should come to live with us, to be with us forever and ever and ever, bound up by your Spirit in life together. May we give you our testimony. May we give you our service. May we bear a faithful witness to those around us. We who are blessed with so many temporal, physical, material aids here cry out in behalf of believers who have so few of these elsewhere. We pray, O oh God, that Emmanuel God with us would truly be our assurance and our strength for all Christians this night and in the days to come. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our closing praise this evening is... I am thine, O Lord, I've heard thy word, and it told thy love to me.
May the peace that surpasses understanding guard your hearts and minds secure in the knowledge and love of Christ. Now, remain with us always.